Westinghouse. First with the future presents the Westinghouse Desilu Playhouse. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Westinghouse Desilu Playhouse. Tonight, we're going to see a story written by Rod Serling and starring William Bendix. Our story begins in a doctor's office. A patient is sitting there. He walked into this office nine minutes ago. Once upon a time, there was a psychiatrist named Arnold Gillespie and a patient whose name was Peter Jensen. Mr. Jensen walked into the office nine minutes ago. It is 11 o'clock, Saturday morning, October 4th, 1958. It is perhaps chronologically trite to be so specific about an hour and the date, but involved in this story is a time element. Well, Mr. Jensen, I think we have some of the facts. Your age, unmarried, no physical ailments of any serious nature, and no previous visits to a psychiatrist. No previous arrests either. And the only time I ever saw a psychiatrist before was in a cartoon. Well, at best, you'll find this helpful. And at worst, harmless. Cigarette? No, thanks. Now, your occupation? Various. Part-time unsuccessful bookie, card dealer. Oh, I attended bar once, just down the street from here, a couple of doors. Andy's place. Well, how do I stack up, doctor? Am I subnormal, abnormal, or just an average American lad? <laughs> Family? Father and mother, both married, Scranton, Pennsylvania. He was a butcher. Butcher? Yeah, he was highly successful. His thumbs weighed 12 pounds. <laughs> That's a good joke. You think so? Maybe you should see a psychiatrist. I think I will take one of those cigarettes. Sure, help yourself. Well, you want me to pull up a couch now? Well, not necessarily, if you're comfortable here. Let's start right here. You can start by telling me why you came. All right. Nothing shakes you up, does it? How do you mean? I mean, everything is calm and cool, and you're the boss. When I walked in here, I could see you making inventory. Check the cut of the clothes, check the language. And up there inside your head, that's where you mark down all the results. And then later on, you put the whole thing in pigeonholes. This fits here, this fits there. You got me pegged, haven't you? No. You figure this is some sort of minor league horse player, maybe a little hungover, maybe a little bugged. But either way, maybe about 40 degrees tilt, My cigarette went out. All right, pigeonhole this one. Look, if said minor league horse player tells you a half-witted story, can you tell me in one simple statement whether or not I'm off my rocker? Without dragging in Sigmund Freud and a lot of medical school English, can you tell me what's wrong with me? I can try. I keep having a dream. Aren't you going to mark it down? You keep talking. I'll just make some notes on things that I think are pertinent. I don't know whether or not any of this will sound pertinent. I do know it'll probably sound nuts. I know it sounds nuts to me anyway. There it is. Okay, tell me about it. Well, I keep having this dream. I've, I've had it, I don't know, five or six times now. What sort of dream? A real one. Did you ever have any wacky dreams that seemed real? Oh, sure. I guess we all have. But have they happened over and over again? Recurred? Same dream? The same dream. Identical. It doesn't change. What's it about? It always begins the same way. I'm asleep. I'm sound asleep.
this is uh, it's 506. Tell me, I got in pretty late last night, didn't I? I beg your pardon, sir. I, I asked you if I got in late last night. Well, I really don't know, Mr. Jensen. I wasn't on duty last night. Oh. Look, have you got any water? Well, you'll find some if you look around, sir. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, Wait a minute. Uh, what do you call this place, anyway? I beg your pardon, sir. I ask you the name of the hotel. L look, do you work here or are you just inspecting the kitchen? I ask you what the name of the hotel was. This is the Imperial Hawaiian, sir. Oh. Are you in the right hotel, Mr. Jim? I haven't got the slightest... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm in the right hotel. Yes. Good morning, sir. Did you sleep well? Mother, that's a moot question. All right, you want to explain the gag now? Excuse me, sir? I asked you if you wanted to explain the gag. You tell the guy who put you up to this he's on the threshold of a deep wound. You tell him I'm going to take out his teeth one by one. This is October, isn't it? October, sir? What's October? 30 days has October, April, June, and November. Remember, this month, it's October, isn't it? October? I don't believe so, sir. What do you mean you don't believe so? Is it October or isn't it? It's December, sir. December 6th. It's what? It's December 6th. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. Dece December 6th. Are you all right, sir? Yeah, I'm all right. Except that I have obviously just come down the home stretch of the biggest toot in the history of man. You say this is December 6th? Well, last night I was in New York City at the Benjamin Willard Hotel and it was in October. You're probably overtired, sir. Maybe you aren't feeling so well. Why don't I come back later? Overtired, I'm not. Not feeling so well. That is the champion blue ribbon understatement of the year. A toot that takes two months and winds up in. What's the name of the place? What's the name of what place? Sir? This place! It's the Imperial Hawaiian Hotel. That's what I mean. Since when is there an Imperial Hawaiian Hotel in New York City? It isn't in New York City, sir. It's in Honolulu. Well, that figures. It's in Honolulu. Which leads me to the next question. What am I doing in Honolulu? I don't know, sir. No, that's what I thought you said. Now, there's just one more question. Really, sir? Why don't I come back later? Come here. What, sir? Does this hotel have a bar? Yes, sir. It's got a lovely bar. And where is the lovely bar? Downstairs, sir. Off the lobby. If I ever have another mother, I'd want it to be you. Come back later, honey, and we'll dance. Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. Honolulu. Would you like a table, sir? No, I want to sit at the bar. But there are no seats left at the bar, sir. Look, if the President of the United States came in here and wanted to sit at the bar, you'd have a seat for him, wouldn't you? Uh, well, of course. Well, I guarantee you he won't be here, so I'll just take his seat. That seat's occupied. You know it. 
I want a dry martini. I want it so dry the olive will come up coughing. You're the boss. Look, I tell you what you better do. You better just keep them coming. I'm on the last lap of the biggest binge in the world. Rough night, huh? 30 rough nights. Would you believe it? I fell asleep in New York a month ago, and I woke up here this morning. Dear boy, I know the feeling. Once I fell asleep at the Dublin airport, and I woke up on a British troop train going into Palestine. And that's my record. 43 days in the arms of Morpheus. <laughs> well, bless you. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. My wife. My drink. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. Take nothing of it. Have you been married long? One day, six hours, and 12 minutes. <laughs> well, I never would have guessed it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> You from New York? Born, bred, and raised. Good man. Sure is. Was. How's that? Was a good man. Yeah, that's what I said. No, you said he is a good man. Well, isn't he? He was. He's not here today. Of course he isn't. He's in New York, where he should be. You know, you've got a nutsy sense of humor. What are you, the argumentative type? You're looking for an argument, buddy? Is that it? No, I'm not looking for an argument. I just want to tell you that if you're kidding me, I'll come behind that bar, and in about three minutes, I'll be able to scrape you up in a spoon and put you in a cup. Let me buy you a drink. No, let me buy you a drink. A drink for the newlyweds. The newlyweds are drinking champagne. Give him champagne. What do I look like? A deadbeat? To the bride and groom. Long may she wave. <laughs> <laughs> you you off a ship? Bet your life. The best baby afloat. The Arizona. What? The Arizona. The Arizona? <laughs> when did they dredge her out of the mud? You're talking about my ship. She's never been close to the mud. She hasn't, huh? Boy, you got a lovely wife and a lousy memory. You trying to tell me she wasn't sunk? I'm not trying to tell you. I'm telling you. The Arizona's never been sunk in her life. She hasn't, huh? You know it. You know it. I don't know it. I say she got sunk on December 7th, 1941. And that's where she sits today, in the mud at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. Now, what do you think of that? What did you say? I said... You hear me? It's 1958. How could it be 1941? It's 1958. How could it be 1941? It's 1958. 1958. Mm hmm. And the dream ends there, huh? No, it goes on. I see, but up to that point, you say that each dream is identical. Identical. I even remember going to the door of the bar, look out in the street, look at all the cars. 39s, 40s, 41s, no fins or anything. Go on. Now, get this. This is probably where I should get on the couch. I don't think this is a dream. You can make all the chicken tracks you want to. This is the goods here. I believe you. You do? 
Well, call up the sanitarium, tell them we'll take a double room. <laughs> I mean, I understand why you think it's real. See, some dreams are extremely realistic. As often as not, they're impossible to distinguish from reality while you're asleep. Have a cigarette. It's run out of fluid. I've done quite a bit of smoking here. Now, where were we? You don't get what I'm telling you, do you? It isn't just that it's real while I'm asleep. While I'm telling you this, while I'm standing here telling you this, it's still real. Everything that happens in those dreams, that's real. Go on. Well, it spills the beans, doesn't it? And this is your problem. That's some problem. A guy who dreams things and thinks they're real. Well, as I told you, some dreams are very real. Oh, I've had dreams like everybody else. But a week ago when these things started, I knew that they weren't dreams. You understand? They're not dreams. Well, if they're not dreams, Mr. Jensen, what do you suppose they are? What do you suppose they are? I wake up in a hotel room in Honolulu and it's 1941. But I mean, I really wake up and it's really 1941. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Jensen. You're not trying to tell yes, me. Yes, I am telling you. I'm going back in time. Are you a bookie or aren't you? Okay, then, this is the bet. I picked Joe Lewis over Buddy Bear. What odds are they give me if I picked the round? What are you talking about? They're not scheduled. They will be. They're going to fight on uh, January 9th. Yes, that's right, Buddy Bear. I pick Lewis in one round. What's the court? 30 to 1. Come on, boy, come on. Well, that's better. Okay, I'll take $500. Right. What do you mean, how do I know? I just know, that's all. Right. Say, wait a minute, you got the name right? No, J-E-N-S-O-N. Jensen. Peter Jensen, that's right. I'm at the Imperial Hawaiian. Wait a minute. Jensen speaking. Right. I'm the guy. I'll call you back. You want to take a bet on the All-Star game for next year? I'll pick the American League. What I spent the next two and a half score? hours in a kind of paradise, making bets on sure things. Every race, every prize fight, every football game I can remember happening after December of 1941. I got it figured out that if this crazy stuff goes on at least six more months, I'm a shoe in to collect about $464,000 from a half a dozen soon-to-be impoverished bookies. I'm not scared, you understand. I don't have one idea what I'm doing back here, but as long as I'm back, I figure I'll put it all to good use. Come in. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. How about a drink? Uh, my uh, wife asked me to stop by and see how you felt. <laughs> that was nice of her. I feel great. How about a drink, huh? No, thanks. We're going swimming. She was a little concerned. My wife, I mean. About what? About me? Well, it's uh, just that uh, down at the bar, when you saw that paper, you began Oh, to... that. Well, that was... Well, as a matter of fact, I was going to give you a ring and tell you that I was sorry about that Arizona stuff, you know, the mud and everything. It was nothing personal, you understand. Sure. Good. Let's see, the... Uh... See, I had the All-Star game, 500. Are you sick? No, I'm all right. Well, what made you say it was 1958? Oh, I guess I was just a little whirly up here. Sure. Well, uh, look, uh... We'll be back about four or five. Maybe you'd like to have a drink with us then, if you feel okay. Huh? You got a deal. Well, we'll see you later then. Fine. Wait a minute. Huh? What do you do on the Arizona? Oh, I'm in the engineering section. You work down below, huh? Most of the time. Good job? I like it. Well, I'll see you later, then. Yeah, we'll give you a call when we get in. All right.
How is he? I think he's okay. He seems so lost. Now, he'll be okay. Said to give him a call when we get in. Wonderful. I remember thinking right at this given moment that these are two nice-looking kids. And while I'm watching them, the thought hits me that this is an awfully young and pretty kid to be a widow after just two days of being a wife. So right at this moment, I do the only thing I can do. I make a jerk out of myself. I want a Honolulu newspaper. I don't care anyone. Mr. Jensen, this is Mr. Gibbons, the editor. Well, Mr. Gibbons, the editor, what's with it? If this information is so hot, why didn't you take it to the Army? Because I figured a newspaper would spread it around a lot quicker. Besides, there isn't time to go to a lot of brass trying to get heard. Well, what about it? You're gonna print it? You're gonna get out an extra? Of course, an extra. And if you take all this down. You dictate to him everything you've got. I can give it to him in about three paragraphs. But I want a guarantee before I do. I want to be sure I'm not going to get stuck in any rubber room with a straitjacket after I finish the story. Go ahead. And you take it all down. All right. I have information that the Japanese are going to bomb Pearl Harbor tomorrow morning at approximately 8 a.m. Honolulu time. You know this to be a fact? As sure as I know the good Lord made racehorses. They're going to come over here in about 30 waves off a bunch of carriers. They're going to plaster us while we're still in our beds dreaming about last night. Pearl Harbor, Oahu, Schofield Barracks, the airfield, and you name it. You got all that down? Yes, sir. Well, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to call a commanding general and tell him to get out all available manpower. I figure that at least 10 or 11 regiments fully combat equipped should be sent to the beach. Now you're talking. We're calling the Navy, too. Aircraft carriers will be sent to the area. I figure there should be at least 1,000 planes. That's action, man. That's action. Then I'm going to recommend to the President of the United States that you lead the troops because you're good officer material. Now you're talking, my... All right, knock it off. Cut the gag. Now, you listen to me. No, you listen. Because I'm going to tell you something, newsboy. Tomorrow morning, you're going to be about 4,000 miles away from any kind of laughing. And you're not going to be able to say that I didn't warn you. Because this is no gag. You're right, it's no gag. Because we're fed up. We've had all we can take for one afternoon. Now, you get out of here peacefully, Mr. Jansen. Or I may have to have somebody escort you outside. I can walk out by myself. And if you try to put anybody at my elbows, you're going to have to call in a hospital staff. I don't appreciate that kind of talk. Oh, you don't, huh? You really don't. Well, what do you appreciate, Mr. Gibbons? Maybe you'd appreciate a good smack in the jaw. Something to repay me for my trouble in coming over here and trying to get in to see you. This is going to hurt me worse than it does you, Mr. Jensen. Believe me. I believe you, Mr. Gibbons. <laughs> Is he out of his mind? It appears to be sane enough. Well, I'm sorry to call you down here, Doctor, but this character went berserk. It took the whole office to keep him here. I think he ought to be fitted for a jacket. You walk on your lower lip one more time, Big Shot, and I'll get you out of the newspaper business on a disability pension. You've never suffered from delusions, have you? You do know where you are, who you are? Oh, stop it. I'm as sane as anybody in this room. And a more incriminating statement I'll probably never make the rest of my life. What is the date today? December 6th. And we're... We're what? We're where? We're in Honolulu, Hawaii. What did you have to eat today, to drink? Nothing. Nothing to eat and precious little to drink. I've spent the whole afternoon wasting my time with these two kooks. Who is the President of the United States? <laughs> Who's kidding who? You're supposed to be finding out if I'm nuts. Eisenhower, who did you think it was? U.S. Grant? Who? 
Who did you say the president was? I... Of course, it's 1941. FDR. Franklin Delano Roosevelt is the president. Who was the other person you mentioned? Eisen something? I was thinking about something else. Franklin D. Roosevelt is the president. Who else did you mention? Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower. He's a light colonel on the general staff in Washington. How did you know about Ike Eisenhower? Who is the vice president, Mr. Jensen? Uh... Uh, Garner. John Nance Garner. John Nance Garner was the vice president. He isn't any longer. Oh. Well, uh, wait a minute now. I... Truman. Harry Truman. Of course it's Truman, because when Roosevelt dies, Truman becomes a president. How's that? What's the matter with you guys? Don't you know that Roosevelt dies and then Truman takes over and then Eisenhower becomes the president? What's the matter with you guys? What's... All right, fellas. I, I take it all back. You named the vice president and that's who it is. Forget I ever mentioned it. Hold it. Sit down, Mr. Jensen. Let's you and I talk this over. Uh-uh. Any of you guys know what a Sputnik is? Hmm. I thought so. <laughs> Rock and roll? Jet stream? Rocky Marciano? Atomic subs? The Los Angeles Dodgers? Well, buy bonds. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Something on your mind, Hannafy? No, nothing, Doc. Except. Except what? There's nothing insane about that man. I didn't say there was. This yours, Hanafi? You're quite an artist. Your plane's Japanese, I suppose. Not really. Just doodles, that's all. <laughs> You'd better watch yourself. I'll be putting you under a light. <laughs> best laid plans of mice and men and Pete Jensen. I just struck a blow for law and order and missed. So what's left to do? Simple. Nothing. Just sit in a bar feeling that kind of sweet, sad glow that comes with realizing that most people aren't as bright as you are. The next morning, they'd probably all come back and measure me for a brass statue, but it would be too late. I didn't care anymore. But it was kind of a crazy feeling, though, to watch these kids relax over their dates and their drinks, when tomorrow morning there'd be a couple of odd thousand of them taking a miserable route through hell to get to heaven. <laughs> a happy New Year to you. Knock it off. I know how it is, pal. Believe me, I know how it is. Once I tied one on in New Orleans around Mardi Gras time. And I woke up outside the bleacher section of Ebbets Field on St. Patrick's Day, still in costume. Believe me, I know the problems of which you are exposed. Hi. How about having that drink with us? Oh, yeah. It's a pleasure. No, some other time. Hello. Hi. I'm a little ahead of you. 
How is the swim? Wonderful. Good. How many hours is it now? 31 hours and 15 minutes. And everybody said it wouldn't last. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jensen? Pete. Pete? Are you all right? Oh, sure, I'm all right. Why? Well, this morning you seemed so sure it was another year. Did I? Well, I guess I was just a little mixed up, that's all, honey. <laughs> and I didn't mean anything personal about what I said this morning, either. Oh, I told you to forget that. <laughs> Around for all of us. Tom Collins for me. Please. Same here. What about you? What are you drinking? Double scotch. Double scotch. Double scotch. You sure like your scotch, don't you, sir? Why, you got a grandfather in the bourbon business? <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter? I wasn't kidding this morning. I meant what I said. The Arizona's gonna get sunk tomorrow morning. Are we on that again? We're on that again. Look, Lieutenant. Ensign. Ensign, Lieutenant, it doesn't matter. I've got no axe to grind, you understand? Tomorrow morning, I've got every intention of going down into the basement and cuddling up to the furnace and spending the whole day listening to the sirens. You say you're an engineering officer or something. That means you're down near the boilers. Well, I'm telling you that at about 8.20 a.m. tomorrow morning, there won't be any boilers. There won't be any decks. There won't be any ship left. And that goes for a lot of boilers and a lot of decks and a lot of ships. Not to mention handsome young ensigns with new brides. Please, don't talk like that. I've got to talk like that. This is the second half of the story. I know what's going to happen tomorrow. Because tomorrow is December 7th, 1941 to you people. But it's 17 years ago to me. That's right. Last night I was in New York City. It was 1958. It was October. It was 17 years after what it is this very minute. And I've lived through those 17 years and I know what's going to happen. Look, you're, you're nice kids. You, you're nice young kids. I've got no reason, no reason in the world to give you grief. I'm telling you that tomorrow morning we're going to get attacked. And if you're on that ship... I'll be on that ship because that's my berth. Mr. Jensen, you're a nice fellow and all that, but if you keep saying crazy, wild things like this and making Edna worried, I'm going to have to pop you. Come on, honey, we'll have our drink at the bar. Wait a minute. Hey, you, I don't want no trouble. You want to fight, go out and fight a lamppost. You shut your mouth. All right, what are you going to do about it? You gonna stand around holding hands and biting earlobes until this boy goes back to his ship? Because I'm telling you, if he goes back to that ship, he may not be alive at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Repeat, he may not be alive tomorrow <laughs> I told you, I don't want no trouble, you hear me? You don't want any trouble, huh? You, you don't want any trouble. All right, I don't want to give you any trouble. I want to give you music. Uh, I'll sing songs for you. Songs you never heard before. Let's remember Pearl Harbor. As we go to meet the foe. You want to hear another one? Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition and we'll all stay free. You hear that? That's a song you're all going to be singing. You're all going to sing that in about a week. Because the Japs are going to...
Want to hear another one? Let's remember Pearl Harbor as we go to meet the foe. I told you. I told you. Why wouldn't anybody listen to me? And then? That's where I wake up. Standing by the doors. Planes coming in low. Bombs dropping. Strafing. That's just where I wake up. Realistic and very frightening. How long has this been going on? How often have you had this dream? Every night for a week. And everything is always the same. Chronologically the same. Everything. Everything. The ensign and his bride. The bar. In my room on the phone. Everything. And the moment when I'm standing by those doors and the planes are coming in. It's always the same. And it's, it's real. It's not a dream, it's real. I'm going back in time. I know. Well, Mr. Jensen, I, I won't attempt to analyze that dream now, except to say this, that very often you dream with a purpose. The dreams are usually significant to something deep-rooted in a man's subconscious. Very often, the subjects that you dream about are not really the things that bother you. They're only symbols of the things that bother you. Look, Doc. Don't try to out-logic me. I'm not trying to pass this off as logic. I just know what I know. I'm going back in time. I can't give you an explanation. I thought maybe you could give me one. But I'll tell you something else. When I'm standing by those doors and the planes are coming in, that's where I wake up. But even after I wake up and I'm lying in bed thinking about it, I know the dream shouldn't have ended there. It should have gone on beyond that. One of these nights, it will go on beyond that. And you have no idea what might transpire in that moment beyond that? No. let's approach it your way let's look at it as if it weren't the dream but let's look at it very practically assume now that it were possible to go back in time now we can assume that you go back in time and you do something let's say you warn people about an accident that you know is going to happen so that the accident doesn't happen but what is it that you're doing by altering the past you change the present. Look, Doc. Now, this is important, Mr. Jensen. It's very important that you grasp this. Let's try this analogy. Supposing, supposing I were able to go back in time. I go back and I'm hit, well, let's say by a taxi. Now, it figures that if I were able to go back in time and were killed, I wouldn't be living today. Not only that, Think of all the other lives affected. I wouldn't have gotten married, I wouldn't have any children, I wouldn't have bought a house. 
Now, all these things wouldn't exist as they do today because I changed them in the past by being killed. So? So, it's not possible to go back in time. We must assume that this is a dream. All right, try this then. All right. I've never been in Honolulu in my whole life before, except during that dream. So after the first couple of times I dreamed this, I... Take your time. Well, I decided I'd put it to a test. I knew the ensign's last name. It was an odd one, Janoski. He told me that he and his girl had come from a little town called White Oak, Wisconsin. I placed a call there. There was only one Janoski in the book. A woman answered the phone. She told me she was his mother. I told her that I was an old friend of his from Honolulu, and I asked, was he there? And then? And then she told me that her son and his wife were killed in Honolulu on December 7th, 1941. He went down with the Arizona. She was shot down near King Street by a plane strafing. Well, Doctor. Are you sure you've never been to Honolulu? Yes, I was there once. When? When I'm supposedly having that dream. All right, Doc, tell me. I don't hear you talking. Well, at the moment, I don't quite know what to say. Dr. Gillespie's patient lay on the couch almost in a stupor. They'd been talking for hours. It was Saturday, and Gillespie had planned to close early and go play golf. At that moment, he'd forgotten golf. He was concerned only with the fascinating and unbelievable story that this man in front of him had told him. And then, as he looked at him lying there on the couch, Dr. Gillespie knew Jensen was falling asleep. He could tell by the look on the face that he was far from resting though his eyes were closed and he was no longer aware of him.
I told you. I told you. I told you. Why wouldn't anybody listen to me? I told you. I told you. I told you. Try this analogy, Mr. Jensen. Supposing I were to go back in time and I were to be hit, say, by a taxi. Now it figures if I went back in time and were killed, I shouldn't be living today. on the rocks. Bourbon on the rocks. Well, happy dreams. Whatever you like. Drink hearty. Pete Jensen, used to tend by here. No? Jensen? No. Just look familiar, that's all. Where is he now? He's dead. He was killed at Pearl Harbor. October 4th, 1958, Saturday, 12.10 p.m. If anyone is remotely interested in the element of time.
forget, next week, the Westinghouse Desilu Playhouse will present the special Lucy Hour Show. The Ricardos make room for Danny with our friends, the Mertzes, Little Ricky, and guest stars, Danny Thomas and his television family.